Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everybody here this morning on a bright, sunny, crisp, cold morning in South Bend. And it's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker of what I think will be two days of exciting, diverse, and, and inspiring talks and panels. So if you're here for the long haul, the next 48 hours, I think you have some, some good things in store. Um, our first speaker, though, today, I, in some ways, needs no introduction. He was introduced well last night, uh, so I'll be brief right now. Uh, professor Jeffrey Sachs is the Quetelet Professor of Sustainable Development and a professor of health policy and management at Columbia University, where he also serves as director of the Earth Institute. An economist, his production of scholarly books and articles has been absolutely prodigious over the last four decades including most recently and most relevantly his 2015 book, The Age of Sustainable Development. I won't begin to list the other books and articles or uh, we, we, I would take up the rest of the hour. Um, he's also co-recipient of the 2015 Blue Planet Prize, a leading global award for environmental leadership. Uh, in addition to his scholarly work, his many contributions to the worlds of policy and practice in, in development have also played out over four decades, uh, nearly unmatched in scope. He's advised dozens of governments since the early 1980s across most of the world's continents and has played a major role in, in advising at least two uh, Secretary Generals of the United Nations, notably in relationship to the establishment of the Millennium Development Goals in 2000. Jeff Sachs, I think it's fair to say, has almost single-handedly put the field of sustainable development on the map. At Columbia, he's worked to establish new curricular programs around sustainable development for both undergraduate and graduate students uh, that are models in the field. And he's helped to found the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Throughout his career, Jeff Sachs has been a passionate researcher, organizer, and advocate against poverty, for global health, and for more sustainable ways to address ch climate change and the other major challenges of our times. Last night, for those of you who were at the panel uh, yesterday evening, at the end of the panel, Scott Appleby, our dean, asked the panelists to name one thing that they would advise the Keough School to do. And he gave them one minute. Um, Jeff's answer came in the form of a metaphor. Uh, he said it was simple, in fact. He said we should focus on smooth landings. Uh, smooth landings, safe landings from all the blind flying that we, humanity, have been doing for the la over the last decades, over the last century or so. Simple, he said, although he proceeded to, he pr he proceeded to simple uh, punchline with a list of the kinds of fairly complex problems and tasks that he has been working on over the last 35 years. Uh, so perhaps not so simple, but I'll, I'll close by inviting Jeff back 35 years from now when we've had the benefit of, of his career's worth of time to begin working on these problems. So I invite him back in 35 years to tell us how we're doing. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Jeff Sachs. Thank you, I accept the invitation. <laughs> I will be delighted to be here. Hmm? You're, you're, of course, Sonia will join. Uh, we'll celebrate the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. These are complex challenges, but not too complex for Notre Dame students. So, uh, and I'm really delighted to see Notre Dame students at nine in the morning. I know that's a big deal. Uh, in college life, it shows that you've really been assigned to be here. Uh, <laughs> so take good notes when you're quizzed on what I said. Uh, but I'm, I'm really, uh, really happy that you're here. And I'm thrilled, of course, with the new Keough School of Global Affairs and especially with the spirit in which it's being created uh, as a school that will combine analytical insight and pioneering efforts and moral commitment. Uh, and I think that that's the great uh, trilogy that we need in the world and, and rarely get. And I know that uh, you're going to play a huge role in, in the success of these goals. 
So I was given a good, good assignment to how to achieve uh, the SDGs, and I'm going to tell you. Uh, but there's a little homework in it, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm going to start with the, the call to action of Pope Francis, who uh, said in Laudato Si, interdependence obliges us to think of one world with a common plan. And I think that that's what we really have potentially in hand right now with the Sustainable Development Goals and with the Paris Climate Agreement that were reached together in the space of just a few weeks. Pope Francis, of course, opened the UN General Assembly the morning of September 25th, the day that the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted. I regard Laudato Si as the call to adopt the Sustainable Development Goals in a way uh, because <coughs> Laudato Si uh, calls for integral human development and sustainable development and calls for a common plan of action. It's a most marvelous document going from the science to the theology to the moral purpose to the action. Uh, and uh, the chapter on, and by the way, also on educational uh, challenges and reforms because Laudato Si also calls on researchers to understand the integrated nature of the problems and to redesign the way that research is done as well in a more integral fashion. So I think it's an absolutely amazing call to action. And the world leaders heard it and took it. <coughs> and they did adopt that morning uh, of September 25th, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So I gave a homework assignment last night to know all of them by this morning. Uh, SDG 7. Mm. Uh, SDG 3. You can, okay, help, good. Are you, even I'm even, it's open book. So, uh, but do learn them. And uh, mom, SDG 13 is climate control. That's what you should be saying. Uh, when, when, when you call home, uh, what are you doing about that? Or, you know, what's our policy uh, in, in the office on SDG 15 on preserving terrestrial ecosystems? 17 goals. <coughs> I tried for three years to get them down to 10. Uh, I was constantly saying in the General Assembly, Moses got it down to 10, and those are even bigger goals. Uh, but, um, as uh, to paraphrase uh, Kofi Annan at one point, Moses didn't have to deal with 193 sovereign states. Uh, and so uh, we ended up uh, with 300 initial proposed goals in the General Assembly getting down to 17. I didn't know how we were ever going to depict 17 also until a uh, very clever graphic artist proved that 17 is three times six uh, because uh, <laughs> there's a box here uh, that says sustainable development goals. So they, they really do nicely array. And this is our, our job. Uh, so it's uh, 18 questions on the exam. Uh, and I'd like to think that this is a 15 year exam, open book, you work in groups. Uh, and, uh, let, let's see what we can do. Now, on a quick uh, snapshot of where countries stand on the SDGs, uh, Bertelsmann Foundation did a very nice job looking at the richest 34 countries. Now the network that I'm pleased to direct for Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is doing it for about 140 countries and we'll release that in a few weeks. There's actually a draft of uh, our report online, but we'll have a formal report by this summer. But Bertelsmann started with the 34 high-income countries. There is a rule in life in public affairs, which is that if you have a league table, as they're called, a ranking of any good thing, Scandinavia is always at the top. <laughs> That's just their role. They're not the top of football league necessarily or many other things, but the top of all good development issues. They're the fairest, they're the most honest, uh, they're highly prosperous. In a report that I 
uh, put out uh, each year with uh, Dr. Tony Annette, who's uh, sitting here, the World Happiness Report. They're the happiest people in the world also. Uh, and uh, in this SDG table, the most SDG compliant country in the world is Sweden. Not surprising. Uh, number two, Norway. Number three, Denmark. Number four, Finland. You get a certain latitudinal tendency here uh, that the Nordic countries are at the top of the list. What does that mean? The sustainable development goals are about three big dimensions of human well-being. The first is economic development. <coughs> and several of the goals are about ending poverty and hunger, about access to basic infrastructure like safe water and sanitation and uh, modern uh, energy services, about decent jobs, about infrastructure. So prosperity is one flank. The second big dimension of sustainable development and of the SDGs is fairness and social justice, of which there are several dimensions, but two that I think are probably most critical are SDG 5. Mm. Really homework by tomorrow morning. Gender equality. And SDG 10. Reducing inequality within and among nations. So that's the social inclusion pillar. And then some pieces of some of the other SDGs when you get down to the target level, such as ending all forms of modern slavery, uh, ending human trafficking, uh, which is part of SDG 8, for example. So social inclusion is the second broad dimension. And the third broad dimension is environmental sustainability. And that's generally SDGs 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So SDG 11 is for sustainable cities. SDG 12 is what's called the circular economy to clean up after the waste cycle, turn waste into usable products, or stop the waste from entering the environment. SDG 13 is to control human-induced climate change. SDG 14 is to protect marine ecosystems. And SDG 15 is to protect terrestrial ecosystems. So on that basis, <coughs> you can make metrics of pollutants, for example, or unemployment, or other indicators that are relevant, gaps between men and women in labor market outcomes. And that's what the Bertelsmann Index did. And to say that the Scandinavian countries are at the top of the list means that averaging over the 17 sustainable development goals, they're very, very strong on all three dimensions. Highly prosperous societies, highly equal societies, and environmentally <coughs> green, very conscious and quite clean, uh, very low air pollution, and typically a high, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> a high dependence on, or high utilization, I should say, of hydroelectric power, especially in uh, Scandinavia, and also of wind power, so using renewable energy. Where does the United States stand out of 34 countries? Where the arrow is 29th out of 34. This is disturbing for us, for a country that believes itself to be at the top of every list, or at least used to. Uh, and we're not even in the top five, top 10, the top 20, when it comes to sustainable development. And the reason is that while we are a very rich society, one of the richest countries in the world, the per capita income of the United States is about $55,000 per person per year, which is more than any place in world history could have remotely dreamt until very, very recently. We're not so good at the two other pillars of sustainable development, and that is the fairness dimension and the environmental sustainability dimension. The United States is one of the most unequal societies in the high income world, probably the most unequal in terms of gaps between rich and poor. And 
in terms of the environment, while we're okay in certain ways, especially having cleaned up air pollution over the cities in the United States over the last 40 years, we're very bad when it comes to human-induced climate change. So bad that one of our two political parties denies it entirely, and the other political party agrees with it, wrings its hands, and does almost nothing. And so it's a very serious issue that we don't have the uh, inside the United States yet, even the commitment to these issues. And when it shows up in a measured ranking like this, the United States looks pretty bad on the list, actually. Now, how do you meet goals? I am a uh, believer that stating goals like the Sustainable Development Goals or their predecessors, the Millennium Development Goals, really make a difference. I believe in goal-based behavior. I believe that for ourselves, that having goals, having objectives, working towards them is one of the most important ways we get anything done in life. And I believe that from a societal point of view, stating goals and working towards them is absolutely essential for successful societies. And now, in a globally interdependent world, vital for the world. So there are two types of people. Some who say, what difference do these goals make? It's the United Nations, more hot air. And the other, I don't know if there are others with me on it, but I'm in the other camp, which say that it's necessary, though far, far from sufficient, to have these goals. I don't even know how the world can hold together if we don't at least state goals together so that we have a shared idea of where we're heading. Of course, there's another philosophy in economics in my own field, which I think is absolutely wrong. It's the idea that the economy or society is what's sometimes called self-organizing. It just evolves in an open way. What's the point of goals? You don't know where society's going. You don't know where the economy's going. It just develops. And if it's a competitive market economy, we say in the textbooks, it gets richer. I think that view is, is wrong, but especially dangerous now because that self-evolving kind of economy doesn't by any means protect the common interest. It doesn't by any means keep inequalities at manageable levels. It doesn't by any means solve the problems of extreme poverty. It doesn't by any means protect the physical environment. So I believe we need goals in order to say, let's stay on track. I gave the analogy last night if, if, that uh, Ted mentioned of the blind pilot landing the plane who has instrument gear for most of the landing but at the end, when he's uh, rolling up to the gate, doesn't know what to do until people start screaming at the end, stop before you kill us, uh, and then pulls the plane to a stop. But I also analogize our world. I feel often, because I hate being in beautiful mountain passes at the edge of cliffs in cars. It's not my favorite thing, even though the rest of the family is enjoying the scenery. I'm usually pretty terrified, as a matter of fact. But I regard what we're up against as indeed being in a pretty fancy car at this point. And actually, there's a lot of beautiful scenery around. And there's a pretty steep cliff at the edge. And staying on the road is quite manageable, but you have to steer a little bit. So, I believe that these goals are really about steering. Now, steering a car is not a heroic act, but it is a life-saving act. And in a way, ending poverty even, or transforming the energy system in the world, is absolutely more manageable <coughs> than one might expect. It's not even requiring great heroism, I'm going to point out uh, in, in a moment, to do this. But you have to steer. And just like the car will go over the cliff if you don't steer, in order for us to achieve the kinds of objectives we want in society, we need some steering as well. 
Now, one good point about having goals is that at least you know what you're steering for. Because if one part of the, uh, one group of the passengers want to go, wants to go to the right and the other wants to go to the left, that's pretty hard you know, for the driver. It's even worse if everybody's grabbing the steering wheel. Uh, it's even much worse if seven billion people are grabbing the steering wheel uh, and trying to uh, manage our uh, <coughs> total earthly vehicle together. We need some direction. We need to know where we want to go. We need to steer to get there. Now, I love a statement about this that President Kennedy made a half century ago in I always like to advertise it, what is my favorite speech of uh, modern presidency, a speech called Kennedy's Peace Speech that he gave in June 1963 when he was urging the American people to take the, uh, have the self-confidence to uh, agree to a peace agreement with the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War, specifically with the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And the speech is absolutely wonderful because instead of Kennedy saying, if we're going to reach this treaty, the Soviets must do this, 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 and this, and, you know, they're tricky and we don't trust them, and so we're going <coughs> to have to keep our eye on them and all the rest, the speech is completely different. It's unique in modern presidential speeches, maybe unique, period, because Kennedy says, if we're going to reach peace, we have to reexamine our own attitudes. And we have to remember that there are human beings on the other side, and they have the same objective. So it's completely reversed. But in the speech, Kennedy talks about the goal of peace, and he talks about how some people feel that it's hopeless, but it's not hopeless. We can achieve this. And then he makes this statement about leadership, which to my mind exemplifies how he led and how I think we need to regard goals like the SDGs. He says, by defining our goal, more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly toward it. And I love that concept. By defining our goal more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly toward it. So what's his leadership message? His leadership message is <clears throat> don't just state a goal, but show that it can be accomplished. And by showing that it can be accomplished, <clears throat> give people hope. And by giving them hope, create a movement towards the goal itself. And that's what I think our job is on the sustainable development goals. It's fine to say end extreme poverty, have every child educated, keep the climate safe. And if you stop there, it actually is not motivating. Maybe it's even demotivating. Maybe it even seems silly. But if you say these are achievable goals, here's what can actually be done. Here's what the steps involved are. Here's why this hasn't happened till now. Here are the new things that one should add in order to be able to break through the bottlenecks. Here's how much it costs. Here's how we could organize that effort. A game plan, a business plan, a strategy. Then people say, no, that's not crazy. That's actually doable. And especially young people say, I don't know about those, but we're going to do it. And that's really, I think, what this is all about. We don't have that in general. We're not <coughs> actually a society these days that sets many clear goals. President Kennedy set a most amazing goal, breathtaking uh, in, in, its, uh, uh, in its ambition, when in the spring of 1961 he said, I urge the American people to adopt the goal of sending a man to the moon and bringing him safely back to Earth before the end of the decade. Can you imagine saying we'll go to the moon and back in 1961 before the end of the decade? 
So it's a clear goal. And then when you read it, by the way, it's also remarkable. He says, uh, I do not want the American people to adopt this goal until they appreciate that it's hard, it's expensive, it's going to be dangerous, it's going to require tremendous energies because we shouldn't take on a goal like this unless we actually proceed to achieve it. And so he gives that very unusual statement, which candidate says, I recommend so-and-so because it's hard. <laughs> it's unimaginable in our politics right now. It's instant gratification, it seems. I'll cut your taxes. I'll cut them twice as much. I'll end your taxes. This is our politics. But Kennedy said, no, we can take this goal, and then NASA showed how to achieve it. it took them 18 months, by the way, to figure out how to achieve Kennedy's <coughs> mission, because they didn't have a clear plan for the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo space shot. They had to scramble to, to decide, we'll have a lunar module, we'll go do it this way. But by 1969, they had accomplished it. Well, the SDGs, in my view, are quite the same. These are absolutely achievable. I wanted a 17-hour lecture, but I was only given an hour, actually 50 minutes. Uh, so uh, I'm only going to talk about two of the 17 goals. But I expect in class you will get assigned understanding and achieving SDG blank because I think that that's really what the homework assignment for our generation is, which is what's the nature of the goal? What are the problems? How can it be achieved? And that question should be asked all over the world, in every country, in every city, I hope in every university, because then we'll get the practical answers that we need. So I wanted to talk about two particular goals this morning, quickly. One is the goal on reducing inequality. It seems like a huge topic. It is a huge topic, but actually there's a lot that is known about it. And I'm going to talk about inequalities in the high-income countries, because inequalities in low-income countries and escaping from poverty, a favorite subject of mine, is the topic of another, another talk. It's just too big a subject uh, for me to uh, discuss right now. I want to talk about the U.S. situation more. But I'll start with the picture. Every goal needs a diagnosis first. You've adopted the goal, then you need the diagnostics. What are the conditions to meet the goal? What are the pathways? What is the design process, strategies, and so forth? So let me do just a quick diagnostic on inequality. On SDG 10, which says reduce inequalities within countries and among nations, I'm going to talk about the within country part for the moment. That is measured by various kinds of <coughs> inequalities measured by various kinds of statistics, of which the most common is the Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient is a number that goes from 0 to 1. 0 means complete equality of income. 1 means complete inequality, which is that one person in the society would own everything and everyone else would have no income. That would be a Gini of 1. In the modern world, low inequality is a Gini coefficient of between 0 0.25 and 0 0.3, the Scandinavian countries. Very high inequality in South Africa or Brazil is a Gini coefficient above 0.5. The United States is about 0.4 to 0.45, depending on the exact measurement of inequality, but very, very high compared to other countries. This is a map that shows a rough estimate of the Gini coefficient. The light green at the top are the lowest uh, values, and you can see that Norway, Sweden, uh, Finland, uh, are, uh, and Denmark are very low inequality countries, as well as the countries of Northern Europe, Germany, and Netherlands, and so forth. All of the Americas are relatively high income inequality, including the United States. 
And of the high income countries, which means Japan and uh, Western Europe and the United States, the US is the only one in red, which on this color coding means high inequality. So we're the highest inequality of all of the high income countries. Now, one point that I would emphasize, actually two points that I would emphasize. One is that history matters a lot. The Americas are among the most unequal countries in the world because of the way that the Americas were settled in the post-Columbian settlement. Europeans came in, uh, decimated indigenous populations, brought slaves, and created, multi uh, created uh, highly stratified, uh, racially stratified societies. We still live off of the legacy of that. But that has led to a kind of inequality that is largely unmatched in other parts of the world and unmatched in high income countries. Colonialism created inequalities. When you think about the apartheid society, for example, in South Africa, one of the most unequal places in the world. Again, racially stratified societies. Or places with natural resource wealth where that wealth has been appropriated by uh, a few families or by one tribe or by a few crooks or by a few companies. And we have the new release of the Panama Files a couple of days ago, which exposes once again how much criminality there is in, in the polite world society. And so you have a lot of inequality in Africa, but Southern Africa in particular, which was brutally colonized and, read on, and led on racial grounds, is among the highest inequality in the world. So many forces which you need a diagnosis if you're going to say in your country or this part of the world, how do we address SDG 10? You'd want to know, is it history? Is it market forces, geography, discrimination, impunity or corruption, or fiscal policy that is a driver of this kind of inequality? In the US, <coughs> the Gini coefficient is high and rising. This is why there is so much unpleasantness about our politics right now. People do not feel that American society is fair, and it isn't fair. It's highly unequal, and there has been no real action by the US government over the last 40 years to reduce the income inequalities. If anything, there has been an exacerbation of the income inequalities. I live about two miles from Wall Street, uh, that's a source of a lot of the income inequality in the country. Within about, uh, I'd say about 40 blocks of our home, there are 40 billionaires uh, in the U.S. Uh, they're on the, uh, we're on the west side, they're on the east side of town. Uh, so it's a d different uh, part of town, but there's tremendous wealth. And they basically have rigged the tax system so that they also pay very, very low taxes. And my ostensibly left of center, center senator uh, Chuck Schumer, a classmate of mine, makes his career in part by defending the tax breaks of the rich and famous in New York so that he gets campaign contributions from them. So it's a rigged system and it has led to a tremendous amount of inequality. There's also tremendous and growing inequality because of skill levels and the fact that over time technology has favored highly skilled workers and replaced low skilled workers with automation. So the gap between those with high education and low education and earnings has also widened considerably in the United States. And this just shows <coughs> the huge uh, variation from a doctoral level to less than a high school diploma in average <laughs> weekly earnings right now. And that gap has risen. This is a graph that shows the earnings on average of different education levels relative to a high school degree, which is the flat line here. And so those with an advanced degree earn a lot more, three times more, but a rising relative rate to high school grads. Similarly with the bachelor's degree, less than high school has been even falling over time. So we've had rising inequality in the United States, partly because of labor market outcomes, 
partly because of the way that our political system is rigged. But here is where I really wanted to focus on the solution side, because I think it's quite interesting. <coughs> These are Gini coefficients across all of the high-income countries. And for every country, two kinds of Gini coefficients are shown. One is what's called the market Gini, which is the income that you earn in the market. The other is called the Gini coefficient for disposable income, which is after you pay your taxes and after you get the benefits from government. So it's what's called the post-tax and transfer. Now, if the rich pay more in taxes and the poor get benefits, that gap is narrowed by taxes and transfers. <coughs> so in general, the gray bar, which is the market Gini coefficient, is more unequal than the blue bar, which is after taxes and transfers. Clear. But depending on the fiscal system in the country, the amount that the government fiscal system reduces the market inequality varies. So if the gap between the gray bar and the blue bar is large, the blue bar is much lower, it means the government's doing the job of taxing the rich and giving to the poor, and thereby narrowing the inequalities. If the two are nearly the same, it means that tax and transfer policy isn't doing very much to narrow the income. What I find interesting about this is that almost every country has a similar level of market inequality. But the differences after tax and transfer are huge. So in, the, in Denmark, for example, happiest country in the world, year after year, there's a lot of inequality of market income, but then there's a big correction through the tax system. Everybody gets health care. Everybody gets free tuition in schools. Everybody gets child care. Everybody gets summer vacation. But they tax themselves to pay for that. And therefore, the taxes are high, the transfers are high, the income gap is reduced. In the United States, however, way over here, <coughs> where our inequality of the blue column, because that's how it's ordered, ordered is one of the highest in the world, we don't get a very big reduction through the fiscal policy. If you're poor in America, tough. That's your problem. In fact, we'd like to cut your benefits more. You're a freeloader. If you're rich in America, that's great. You give me campaign contributions. Could I cut your taxes more, please? That's American politics. And so the correction between the market and the disposable income is actually a very, very small correction. Now, <coughs> what's the problem? So here I array arrayed the countries from the lowest tax to GDP ratio to the highest tax to GDP ratio off of the left axis. Mexico collects 20% of GDP in taxes. The United States by this particular measure, by the way, so you'll see slightly different measures everywhere, about 26% of GDP collected in taxes. Denmark, nearly 50% of GDP collected in taxes. And they're the happiest country in the world, by the way. <laughs> Something unimaginable in the United States. We're told that the only way to be happy is to have no taxes. But if you have taxes and you also have six weeks summer vacation and free health care and free tuition and <coughs> free all the rest and everybody is prosperous in your society, you're actually pretty happy, by the way. <laughs> so this uh, green line is the post-tax and transfer Gini coefficient. You see one basically slopes up and the other basically slopes down. By having higher taxes, and devoting them to a tax and transfer system, you reduce the inequalities. <coughs> this is a similar graph. Also, once again, the tax to GDP ratio rising and the poverty rate falling. So if you want low poverty, a high tax system which then 
gives child care, child support, pre-K, health care for all, you reduce the poverty rate. These are choices, is what I'm saying. These are social choices. When you've done the diagnosis, <coughs> you find out that SDG 10 becomes susceptible of policy decisions. So what are the key steps to realize SDG 10? Universal access to health, nutrition, and quality education, which, by the way, is SDG 3, SDG 2, and SDG 4. Tax to GDP ratios that are sufficient for the universality of those services, like in the Scandinavian countries. Development aid that is sufficient for universality of these services in the poor countries. In other words, poor countries can't afford to get universal health coverage. But with a little help from their friends, they can do it. What's interesting is those Scandinavian countries, by the way, are also at the top of the list of the aid that they give as a share of GDP. What's the matter with those people? <laughs> don't they know how to fight wars? <laughs> they don't even know how to spend money on the military. We get 5% of GDP on the military, and we're able to keep our aid down to 0.2 of 1%. And we got candidates that want to cut it all to zero. Whereas in Scandinavia, those fools, they've got the aid, they're giving away 1% of their income. And they're so confused, they think they're happy. <laughs> Eliminate tax havens and tax impunity. And I wrote this chart before the Panama Papers were released. We're living in a sea of criminality, unfortunately. But it's rigged because it's not criminals away from the political system. It's the politicians, unfortunately. In the United States, we're very clever. We legalized it all. You can give as much wealth as you want to your favorite politician. The politician can take as much wealth as she wants. And uh, we end up with a, a real mess. Yes, I did say that. Um, <laughs> education as a key to long term. <laughs> I didn't mean to make a <coughs> political advertisement, but I couldn't resist. Um, education is key to long-term inclusive development. And finally, using information and communications technologies as key. And the reason that they're so key is that they provide very low-cost, innovative solutions for universal coverage of health and education, among other goals. So they're absolutely key to success. Now, quickly, quickly, I was going to do one more of these SDGs, SDG 13. And I, I know I don't have much time, but I do want to talk about an environmental objective the same way. This is to stop human-induced climate change. You know that it's hard to talk about global warming here, uh, I admit, uh, <laughs> this, this morning. But um, it's a serious problem, except here. Uh, <laughs> most of the world is warm, and 2015 was the warmest year on instrument record. February of this year was the warmest month on instrument record, meaning if you compare February to its preceding average, the rise this past February was 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer than the 20th century average for February. We're way on our way to blow out of global warming. And that's why we have SDG 13. Now, what the most recent data shows also, you will not find this as compelling as my wife and I do. But the last time Earth was two degrees Celsius warmer than it is, I'm sorry, the last time that Earth was two degrees warmer than the pre-industrial level, that's the baseline for all of these statements. Pre-industrial level means the Earth's average temperature around the year 1800. The last time the Earth was just two degrees warmer than in 1800, and were one degree warmer than that already. The sea level was about five meters higher than it is today. Now, you may not care here as much, but we live on an island. 
all of Manhattan. Uh, it would be completely underwater. And the truth is, what NASA is uh, showing here by this map, we would lose a lot of the world's surface. And since a lot of the biggest cities in the world have been built on the coasts, because that's where you trade, that's where you sail, that's where uh, you have the estuaries, the favorite locations, most of the world's large cities would be devastated by this. This week's cover story of Nature magazine is showing that the scientists are now saying that the potential loss of the Antarctic ice sheet is far faster than had been believed and modeled previously because what the science is understanding is that these ice sheets don't just melt, they break up. And they break up because a lot of the ice sheet is actually underwater. And that underwater buttress is melting away in the warmer ocean water. And that causes the buttress to go away and then to accelerate the collapse of these ice sheets into the ocean, which raises the ocean level. This is one of the main reasons why climate change is potentially catastrophic. It's not the only one, but it's one of the ones. The others are the mere fact that higher temperatures, more droughts, more floods, more extreme storms could also devastate the world's food supplies. So there are causes for action. What is the essence of achieving SDG 13? In that case, to stop human-induced climate change, the essence is to stop the emissions of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels. That's overwhelmingly the driver of climate change. The blanket of warming gases, of which the most important is carbon dioxide, that gets thicker and thicker, or more concentrated, as we emit carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and other greenhouse gases through our industrial processes. And the main way that we need to stop human-induced climate change is to shift from the fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, to low-carbon energy. Hydropower, wind power, solar power, nuclear power, or perhaps a technology called carbon capture and sequestration. But we don't have more choices than that, and geothermal and some other uh, energy sources that are not in potential abundance as much, but could play an important role in some parts of the world. Technically, we need to change the curve of CO2 emissions from the business as usual path of this red line, or even <coughs> this uh, less uh, dramatic uh, upward sloping curve, to the blue line, what's called decarbonization. And the notable point about this blue line is that it passes through zero in 2070. We have to decarbonize the world's energy system, not be a little more fuel efficient, not merely shift from coal to gas, but get out of the fossil fuel business this century. That's not simple, because the fossil fuels brought us to the modern economy. Without coal, oil, and gas, we were living in global <coughs> poverty. But now we have the science and the technology to make that change. <coughs> we need to strand, actually, a lot of what we already know to exist. We can't burn it safely. That's why the decision not to build Keystone Pipeline was so correct. Yes, Canada has dirty oil sands, but there's no place in a safe world for them to be burned. We have already more than enough fossil fuels that we can safely use. We have to be investing not in developing every fossil fuel we can find, but in making the shift to low carbon energy. And while I am absolutely running out of time on my favorite subject, this includes strategies of decarbonization, energy efficiency, low carbon or zero carbon electricity, and then what's called fuel switching. In other words, we all get to drive Teslas in the future. That's, uh, that, that, that's where we're heading uh, in this uh, marvelous century of ours. And one can show for the United States, as uh, our SDSN project has shown, that this is utterly feasible. It's not even that costly. It's less than 1% of our national income to do this. But we need a plan. We need to look ahead. We need to decide that this is important. 
We need to escape from the incredible corruption of our politics because there's good news and there's bad news about our politicians. The climate deniers, which is the entire Republican Party, I'm afraid, right now, the good news is they are not as dumb as they look. The bad news is they are more corrupt. They are ready to sell your safety and your future for campaign contributions. That's all it is. Everybody in Washington knows it. Everybody gets it. This is called smart. It's the most cynical game in the world because it's about your future and it's about the future of your kids. And that's what they're doing right now. They're absolutely selling it out so they can have another TV ad. They're all so salivating over the Koch brothers' money, they don't know what to do. And the Koch brothers are the largest private polluters in the world. So, long list of meaningful actions, no time. <laughs> so what are the overarching truths? The overarching truths are we have the economic and technological means to achieve these goals. We're threatened by inertia, distraction, outmoded institutions, and antisociality. Antisociality means doing something that you know to be damaging others for your personal gain. It's a pervasive behavior. It's the politicians' morning till night behavior for most of them. It's the lobbyists' morning till night behavior. It's the tobacco industry. It's the hydrocarbon industry. It's the Wall Street. It's the tax evaders. That is what really kills us. Not that we're too poor to do this. Not that we don't have the means. Not that we don't have the technology. So what are our chief tasks? To focus, that's really important, by the way. Maybe the hardest thing in our world right now, attention. Pay attention. That's the first thing a goal allows you to do. Pay attention. It's important. It's not a sound bite. It's a goal for the world. Second, to think. That's why we love you. This is the place to think. And for the students, think because you'll be doing more thinking now than you'll ever have time to do again. <laughs> and what you learn here, you're going to use for your whole lives. Think about how to achieve these goals. Plan. This is a word that became a dirty word in America. Because central planning, communism. We need plans. We don't have to adhere rigidly to them. Plans can go along with markets, but we need to plan an energy transition over the next 50 years. We need to think this through. It hasn't been done yet. And finally, to act ethically. Because if we look, we think, we plan, we'll realize that what we want is within our reach. And to be within our reach then requires the good ethics to know that what counts is human well-being. Thank you very much. That was, I think, a bleak story with a hopeful ending. The good news is that, first, is that uh, we'll have a couple more days for continuing conversation, many panels. Jeff is going to be around for the next couple days. There's <coughs> plenty of chance here in this room and outside for continuing conversation. Scott Appleby. I asked you last night to give a big answer in one minute. I'm going to ask you now, before we adjourn, to go back to the slide you skipped and give us one minute on it. On, on climate? Yeah. Okay. One minute. Good. Very good. Okay. What do we need to do? It's simple. <laughs> See, we have seven points in one minute. Uh, is uh, eight point, uh, eight point five, uh, eight point five seconds per point. First, we need to prepare what now in the Paris Climate Agreement are called LEDS, Low Emissions 
development strategy. <coughs> we need to have technical scenarios up to the year 2050. I'm sitting in a New York City uh, planning exercise. First time ever, New York City is asking, how can we reduce emissions by 80% by 2050? They've never thought about the question before. In New York State, there's only a plan up to 2030. I said, how about 2050? The head of the New York State Authority said, that'd be a good idea. <laughs> I said, you're responsible for it. He said, well, can you help? And I said, of course, we'll, we'll work together on that. We need to think how to make the energy transition. Second, we need to stop doing things that we know don't work in a two degree C or less world. In other words, we, we're going to have to leave a lot of hydrocarbons in the ground. Arctic drilling, it's out. No reason for it. Ultra deep sea drilling, stop. Fortunately, with low oil prices right now, all of that is temporarily stopped. But if the prices rise, don't start back. We don't need that. We need wind, hydro, solar, and so forth. <coughs> Basically, no new coal plants in the world, except if they have carbon capture and sequestration alongside them. We need a global scale up of <coughs> research and development outlays for high performance batteries, fourth generation nuclear, ICT enabled the smart grids, electric vehicles, CCS, and so forth. We need urban policies like New York City's trying now, 80% reduction by 2050, plans for especially building codes because that's what cities are about buildings and transport. So it's moving to public transport, walking, electric vehicles, self driving vehicles probably as part of the electric vehicles, and uh, well-insulated, well-designed buildings that have a much lower uh, heating load and that also can work on heat pumps. In other words, electrification rather than boiler rooms with uh, gas or coal or, or heating oil. Recapitalize the MDBs, the multilateral development banks for large-scale climate financing for poor countries and capitalize the GCF, the Green Climate Fund, with around $10 billion a year for the poorest countries. This is an action agenda that's actually practical. What it requires, though, on any list like this is that this exercise should be underway in a decentralized <coughs> manner all over the world. And I'll just close with one example. This uh, November, I will help organize with the Moroccan government, which is the host of COP22, that's the post Paris meeting of the Framework Convention on Climate Change, a conference that we're calling the Low Emissions Solutions Conference. All the meetings of the Climate Change Treaty up until now have been diplomats, which is fine. And I have loved to love diplomats, by the way because they have one great art, which is not killing people that they don't like. They're artists of talking across cultures and politics. We vitally need diplomats. But they're not very good engineers, by the way. They don't really know much about low carbon transitions and all the rest. So putting them in the climate room was great to get the treaty last year, but it doesn't help us solve the problem. So we're going to put in the room this year 196 delegations of engineers, basically. And they're not going to negotiate. There's no final outcome document. They're going to brainstorm like engineers do for five days. And they're all going to walk out and say, God, that was amazing. Now we have a direction of uh, what, what to do. So that, I think, is the practical side. What I would love for the Keogh School to do, uh, and what we're trying to do with Columbia, and what we're trying to do through our network, is take on this design challenge of what would it mean to move to a low carbon transition path. Perhaps do it for the Midwest, which is a coal rich region, but there's plenty of wind power, for example, huge amount of wind, and with the right kinds of connect connections and building up a grid and smart grid 
This region could be a low carbon energy region in 50 years with a particular direction. New England and New York and, and uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, the Northeast, doesn't have such a plan. I'm trying to help get some planning started. But maybe here you would work with Purdue and work with others to do it for the Midwest. Because we need in every part of the United States to show that it's manageable to make the transition. And that brings me back to <coughs> Kennedy's point. If it was possible to put a man on the moon and bring him back safely to Earth in eight years, we can figure out this energy puzzle. But we need the engineers and the policy types and the direction to do it. We've now got the directive to do it, SDG 13 and the Paris Climate Agreement. But now it's actually showing how to do it. We can't wait for the politicians. They don't know how. They don't like this topic. <coughs> Weirdly enough, it's not their job. It is their job, but they don't know it's their job. <laughs> so we have to do it and then show it to them and say, you know, it's not so painful. And it actually is the only safe way for the United States. So that's what I would recommend on any of these goals. Get the assignments. Start sketching it out. We'll make partnerships across uh, universities and with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And the expertise <coughs> now is global. And so it's possible to have great projects that are virtual, uh, that are energized and, and uh, very active and at the highest caliber of expertise in a global network. And if we show these plans and convince people, not only is this manageable, it's a safer world, doesn't cost very much, and the Teslas are going to be a lot more fun. <laughs>